Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy, bright and early here at our studios in Southern California. So good to see all of you in a metaphorical sense. On today's show, The Purge gets a prequel, Fifty Shades gets freer, and it has billions and billions served. Ashley, who's joining me today? Also here is John Schnepp. Oh, we were just talking before the show, too drunk or too stoned? Too much weed? <clears throat> too much alcohol. Anyway, what's up? <laughs> also here, Perry Nemirov. So I had a weekend where my social media f uh, feeds were filled with creepy clowns and octopus beaks. Uh, thank you for that, Cody. Yeah. I will never forgive you. <laughs> also here, John Roca. How's it going, everyone? I'm barely alive this morning. Perry took my ass to school with some crossfitting, and I'm wearing... So whatever's left, uh, this is all I have to wear today because <laughs> nothing else fits. I'm just in pieces. <laughs> Hobbling around like an 80-year-old man. So you were a CrossFit fiend. You know, back in my day, oh boy, you wanted to be a CrossFit <laughs> fiend, you had to earn it. You couldn't just go to a gift shop and buy a sweatshirt for $15. He bought the shirt I, after he did the workout, so it's okay that he bought the shirt. And I, and I hate to break it to you, but there's no gift shops in CrossFit stores. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how exercise works, but I know how movie talk works. To some extent, we were so excited about what it did at the box office this weekend. That, look, we bumped it all the way up to the top story on the rundown. So, Ashley, tell us about it. The box office slump is over as it debuted in theaters this weekend to record-breaking numbers, claiming the largest opening for an R-rated horror film ever, as well as the largest opening weekend for a horror film of any MPAA rating. It easily took the number one spot, delivering an estimated 117 million and shattering expectations. It is also the second largest opening for an R-rated feature, just behind Deadpool's 132.4 million opening last February, and is already the fifth highest grossing R-rated horror film of all time after just three days in release. Open Roads Home Again took the number two spot with an estimated nine million. Lionsgate's The Hitman's Bodyguard finished in the number three spot with an estimated 4.85 million. And Annabelle Creation took the number four spot with an estimated four million as its domestic total climbed to 96.2 million. Rounding out the top five was the Weinstein Company's Rin River with an estimated 3.2 million for a domestic total topping 25 million. Mark, thoughts on its record opening weekend? I love this story for so many reasons. And Schnapp, I guess in Perry and Roca's terms, you would call it a box office phenom because nobody <laughs> could have projected that it was going to make this much. And once again, it gives credence to my theory that box office projections really don't mean anything. They really do not mean anything. People had this movie pegged at $60 million, maybe opening weekend. And then right before some of us got excited, I thought it might go up to 80 or 85, even $90 million. 117 million just a week ago everyone was saying the sky is falling with the box office that nobody's going to the movies anymore sometimes you just have to give the audience credibility that they're saving their money for something they really want to see in a movie theater and it was certainly that i think it was a confluence of a lot of events a great marketing campaign a really scary villain and a lot of people wanting that collective experience together plus Critics loved it. Audiences loved it. It had a great cinema score, a great Rotten Tomatoes score. It had everything going for it. And now the box office returns prove that. So, Schnepp, your thoughts on the Reese Witherspoon movie, Home Again, coming in at number two. Uh, Home Again is a very special movie. I, I went there. I had a big pack of Hubba Bubba bubblegum just to get into the mood. Yeah. And then Bubba. for some Bubba reason, Bubba. right at the very last moment, I decided to go see It. <laughs> I don't know why. It was weird. You didn't get to check out It this weekend, did you? Like? I did. I saw it with a regular group of uh, audience, is what it's called. Mm -hmm. um, for Civilians. All the, through the screening people Civilians. here, they don't understand what we normally do. We go see movies with regular people. Um, I thought it was great. It was fantastic. It reminded me of The Goonies. That's my the, the closest I can say is it was a scarier Goonies. It was Goonies with a creepy clown. <laughs> um, and Stand By Me, it had all those elements to it. But it's really, really fun. It's not as scary as a lot of people. Don't don't go there expecting to like, you know, wet yourself. It's not gonna you're not gonna, you know, unless you really have a problem with clowns, then you might get more scared. But it's it's more creepy than scary. So I really enjoyed it. Even if you have a problem with clowns, I, I totally endorse what Schnepp just said, Perry. Is that I, I don't think it's the scariest movie ever made, but you do get those those chills in the theater. It didn't stick with me afterwards. I wasn't looking in my closet for clowns as I usually do every night. But <laughs> watching it in the theater, it was such a fun community experience. I think that's one of the reasons why it crushed so hard in the box office. Well, one of the things about it that's 
stuck with me because when I saw it, I had folks like Wendy and Makuga in mind. And when I'm watching it, <laughs> trying to assess it for them, I'm like, no, it, it might be too scary because they are directly scared of that kind of thing. It made me walk out and think really long and hard about what I'm afraid of and what it might transform into if I ever encountered it. So that's one way that it stuck with me. But I am so, so happy. And I don't want to say that tracking means nothing. It's This is the time when tracking is so exciting, when something is predicted to do really well and make something like 60 to 70 million, because that still would have been a great opening for it. But then it just obliterated everything. I have never been so happy to have been so wrong with my predictions. I think by the time I actually filed my predictions on Thursday night, I said 70 million. Mm -hmm. It almost made 120. There's folks out there that are going to have their weekend one predictions of it met in weekend two. That's crazy. I'm so happy for everyone involved in that. You heard it right. Perry Nemiroff was off $47 million, <laughs> and she still was closer than most box office predictions. I think when it comes to movies like this, you can use a is some sort of analyst expectation as a barometer for what the movie might make. But Roca, I mean, yeah. here, did you just throw out predictions from now on? What do you make of this huge score for it? No, I think these uh, these kind of movies are the ones that make you question box office predictions if you want to, but they're anomalies. You can't really predict these kinds of things because you're right, there's so many factors that were involved at this time, and especially last week when no new movie was released, I think the audiences were desperate to go someplace. And, and the thing is, it could have crossed even more. It could have made even more money if Hurricane Irma had not hit because that was like, the, like 72 theaters were closed in Florida, and imagine how much money would have come in there to probably push this almost to 120 million or over, you know, right? So this is what's fantastic about this film. It, it, just, just, it just grabbed the collective psyche of people across this country, and they went and had a great time. I went with 12 of my friends to the Arclight Cinerama Dome, and I disagree with all three of you. I was scared out of my effing mind. And I don't have to think about clowns. I don't have to think about clowns. But two words for you. When you go see this movie, projector scene. That's going to make you jump to the ceiling like a, a cat on uh, Looney Tunes hanging with your claws from the ceiling. Like, it made me go insane. So, to me, this was a grand, old, fun, scary time in the theater, which we haven't had in a very long time. And... And, and it was also a very well done film with a good storyline, great acting, really some very mature themes that, that push your, the boundaries of what you want to see kids experience on film, but, but also brings back the, like this idea of camaraderie and friendship and this connection and what it means and how you can bond in a terrible situation with people you normally might not have been connected to. So there's so much about this film that, that uh, is fantastic and is fun, and the scariness is just, on, honestly, it's the huge cherry on top of that scary-ass cake because I was, I was going out of my mind. I loved it. The budget is estimated at $35 million, so Ooh. I think it's going to do okay. Its average per screen was a cool 28 thousand dollars and it opened on over four thousand screens and so my question to you guys now is as you look forward to this coming weekend mother is coming out an american assassin do you think either one of those has a chance at toppling it or do you think we're going to wait until the week after when kingsman to the golden circle comes out Perry? nowhere close and i'm not saying that mother and american assassin are going to perform poorly but it couldn't be in a better position yet again to make a ton of money and you bring up hurricane irma i think the number was close to 175 theaters and the stats oh, wow. that I got yeah. from Box Office Mojo said that Florida box office typically represents 5.5 to 6.5 percent of the domestic gross east weekend. So if you have all those theaters closed, a whole bunch of people in the state who couldn't go because they, they wanted to stay home and be safe in the weather, yeah. that could probably play a factor next week with that weekend one to two drop. And I think part of the reason that the number was so big this weekend, because I have this problem, is that it's the kind of movie that you can't just see it once. You fall in love with those kids and you need to see it again. So I have a very good feeling that there's going to be a lot of repeat viewings next weekend. Steph, what do you got? Mother, American Assassin, combined, can they beat it this weekend? <laughs> Absolutely not. I mean, even with a 65% drop, it wins. <laughs> the box office again. So I don't think it's going to have that kind of a steep drop. I think you're right. I want to see it again. It's a very, it's a really enjoyable film. Um, it, it has, it, well, I guess, let, let me clarify. It is very scary. It mm. just doesn't have those kind of jump scares that a lot of other horror films kind of do those cheap, like, oh, it was a cat or, oh, something came around the corner. Mm. This really does, like, it's it, like when it shows up, it's there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. We like yeah. to use that word, it, quite a bit. So 
Um, yeah, I think it <laughs> is going to be win the second weekend of box office by a lot. Yeah, Roka, while we were watching Kirk Cousins throw inaccurately most of the day yesterday, we saw a lot of Kingsman 2 promos. So while that marketing is ramping into high gear, yeah. I think that that is going to be the movie that topples it and nothing this weekend. Yeah, I agree with you completely. And you want to talk about scary, watch Kirk Cousins play quarterback. We'll no, get better, listen, damn it. It's listen. one week. <laughs> but no, this is, this is true because n neither of these films is tracking anywhere near uh, the attention that it has. Neither one of these films has it. American Assassin, I'm definitely looking forward to that. And Mother is getting nice reviews coming out of TIFF, I think. And so I'm excited to see what that's all about. Mother! I'm excited to see what that's all about. <laughs> but American Assassin is one of the interesting... But neither one of these films has anywhere the clout to smash into it and destroy it at any point. So I think Schnepp's right. Even with a 65% drop, it'll still beat it. And it won't drop anywhere near 65%. I know I'm going back. i got to see it in IMAX. I want to get really super scared, so I'm going to go see it in IMAX. That's right, and uh, you guys brought up Hurricane Irma. We really hope that everybody yeah. watching from Florida is doing okay, that everybody's staying safe in Florida. And something very easy you guys can do right now if you want to, you just text 90999. You text the words RED CROSS, put it all in caps, RED CROSS, and you can help donate to hurricane relief efforts. It's the easiest thing to do. I did it watching football and watching the Redskins. We'll talk about it. <laughs> all right, let's move on to our next story. What do we got, Ashley? THR is reporting that Denzel Washington's son, John David Washington, is joining director Spike Lee and Get Out director-producer Jordan Peele in a new movie entitled Black Klansman. The movie will tell the true story of Ron Stallworth, a detective in Colorado Springs who, in 1978, answered an ad in the local newspaper seeking new Klan members. Stallworth, who is black, was able to gather intelligence by pretending to be a white supremacist on the phone and sent a white fellow officer in his place for any in-person meetings. During his his undercover work, Stallworth managed to sabotage several cross burnings and other activities of the notorious hate group. No release date has been set at this time. Roka, what do you think about Spike Lee directing Black Klansmen with Jordan Peele producing? I, I love this idea because this is where Spike Lee shines and flourishes. These films that explore the racial tensions, racial unrest in a way that makes you look at it differently. Do the Right Thing is still a seminal film. In, his, in the history of film. And so to me, him going back to this well, which he hasn't been in quite some time, uh, excites me. And having Jordan Peele involved, especially Jordan Peele, who just did Get Out, you get two generations of uh, African-American filmmakers looking at this subject and exploring it for two generations' eyes. And I think that's really important because Spike Lee's version of it may be different than Jordan Peele's version of it. We see this happening when we see millennials' approaches to things. Like, we have to take that into account because those are the people that you're making films for across the spectrum. But I also think this is an interesting story because Stallworth, the guy they're profiling, was black. He managed to become the head of his local KKK chapter by pretending to be a white supremacist via phone, of course, Correspondence. This makes me. This reminds me of the Chappelle sketch where he becomes, yeah. the, you know, the, <laughs> yeah. that's the same exact yeah. thing. <laughs> so I think this is a, a more serious approach, obviously, but it's a fascinating story to explore and find out. Because then, when he wanted to infiltrate him and they needed to see somebody, he recruited a white police officer. This is a black man recruiting a white police officer to go in and pretend to be him for the KKK, and they stopped a lot of uh, uh, cross burnings and other activities. And this is, once again, this is great for Spike, because the last thing he did was Chirac, which is which you know has our friend Jay Washington in it. So it's nice to see him going back to this well. And I think, I think I can't wait, because I think this is going to be a really fantastic film. Yeah, that Chappelle Show sketch. Of all of the yeah. Chappelle Show sketches, that might be the funniest one. And then somebody who picked up the proverbial sketch show baton from Dave Chappelle mm. was Jordan Peele. And so having him involved in this, I think, makes total sense, it, not just from Get Out, but also the comedic sensibility that he could bring to this. This is yeah. not going to be a comedy by any stretch of the imagination, but there could be elements of humor here. And Spike Lee is a guy who I don't think gets enough credit for being as broad of a filmmaker as he is because he has a lot of different genres that he can play. And if you have something that's very socially and culturally relevant, like Malcolm X or Do the Right Thing, but also Inside Man, that was a nice thriller vibe. Mm -hmm. And then uh, something like even his remake of Old Boy, which was like a more action intense. So I think that this movie is going to have a lot of elements to it and the, the combination of Spike Lee and Jordan Peele really get me excited combined with the fact it's a true story this has all the makings of something pretty interesting how do you see it Perry yeah I'm right there with you guys on this and you know the the most recent Spike Lee movies I've seen are Chirac and Old Boy so it just 
goes to show, if you look back at his filmography, mm. how many different areas he can dip his toe in. And when I read about this, and you know, the limited amount I know about the details of the story and what happened, it does seem like they might be able to incorporate a little bit of everything here. And when I think about what Jordan Peele accomplished on Get Out and what Spike Lee has accomplished over the course of his career, the possibilities are really endless. The two of them coming together should bring this to screen in a really interesting and powerful and appropriate way. Mm. So I am so excited to see what they do with this. I kind of want to go and grab the book that Stallworth mm. wrote about the whole experience and just the opportunities this is that this is going to give them when trying to kind of establish a sense of thrill in this story when you have someone who so much of the correspondence was done on phone. There's just so many visual challenges here that I'm really excited to see how a super visual director like Spike Lee tackles it. Uh, John Schnepp, your thoughts? Uh, racism is stupid, and uh, <laughs> I'm always amazed and shocked that in the society that we live in, in the year two, 2017, that we still have racism. So to be able to shine some light on the stupidity, and, and, and you have two amazing uh, directors, comedians, writers uh, involved, uh, makes me interested to see this film. You're right, it, 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 does, uh, it does remind me a little bit of the Chappelle uh, uh, sketch just because that Chappelle sketch was so strong mm -hmm. in its uh, in the showing of the dichotomy of how stupid you'd have to be to hate someone because of the color of their skin. You'd have to be blind, literally. So uh, I can't wait to see what these guys do. That's right. This is a scenario where catfishing indeed can have positive benefits. And John David Washington will be playing Stallworth. He's on the HBO show Ballers. He's an up and coming actor. Um, so it, th there's a lot of excitement around this right now. Apparently, Jordan Peele has been working on this for a couple of years. So mm -hmm. as culturally relevant as it might be right now, I think it's something that he's wanted to do for a while. Stallworth's biography came out in 2014. So there's a lot of momentum going for this project right now. We're really excited to see the results. All right, let's move on to, is this buy or sell? Are we there? We are. Let's do it. <laughs> Ashley's right. going to give us a premise. We'll say whether we buy it or sell it, and then we'll purge. <laughs> <laughs> New details and a title have been announced for the fourth chapter in the Purge Horror series. In an interview with Vulture, franchise creator James DeMonico revealed the title will be The Purge, The Island, with the setting and concept taking place during the very first Purge and centering on an experimental test on Staten Island. DeMonico said the movie will drop next July 4th and alluded to the concept, opening up all kinds of possibilities for the writers, both on a narrative level and as a platform for social commentary. No word yet on a cast, but DeMonico did reveal that there's a singular hero in this movie that's sort of an anti-hero inspired by Clint Eastwood in Unforgiven. Perry Byers sell the new Purge movie being set during the first Purge. I'm going to buy it. And I'm not just going to buy it because it's horror and because it's The Purge. Really, saying that the next movie was about The First Purge is the only way I would have bought a Purge for. I really liked the first two movies. And I think that the second movie needed to be a sequel, given how I responded to the first one. The third one, though, that to me crossed a line mm -hmm. to being mean-spirited and, and kind of destructive. And after that movie, all I wanted to do was get as far away from the whole Unleash the Beast campaign as I possibly could. I walked out of that movie f feeling down, feeling dirty. I didn't have any fun with it anymore. It was an interesting. I didn't get into people's heads with why they would purge. You seem like you really I, went through a purge, Peter. <laughs> yeah. I, I walked out of that really upset because yeah. I was really into the franchise. I'm a big fan of James DeMonico. And I think that this concept has so much potential to actually say something interesting while still being thoughtful and scary and that just missed the mark by such a wide margin mm. I that was one of the few movies uh, last year I believe or the year before last year that I walked out kind of angry with how much I didn't like it but this idea I've been saying it since the second one hit theaters I remembered my interview with James DeMonico I'm not saying why this is why he did this but when we were talking about all the different possibilities one of the ones that was most intriguing to me was like how the heck did something like this even start so the the idea of testing it out on an island is really intriguing to me, especially as a New Yorker, when they start to say that it's happening on Staten Island. And in the in these quotes, he describes how, so folks on Staten Island, if you announce the purge, you can get out of Staten Island and just go over to Brooklyn. 
the way that they fix that issue in the movie is that they offer money for you to stay in Staten Island and to make this experiment happen. So there's so many different angles and little little <laughs> nuggets you could throw in to make the story a little more intriguing. Only thing that's a little bit of a red, red flag for me, and this is just my knee-jerk reaction because I'm so used to having a family or a group of survivors, is the one man's story. That's mm. the only thing. I'm sure there's going to be supporting characters in the mix, but really that was the only thing in this that made me think, I don't know if I want that, but okay. And there were supporting characters in the last two Purge movies, to be sure, but I mean, my focus was on Frank Grillo's character. Now, this is not going to be Frank Grillo's character, it doesn't appear, because he had a breaking point. That character had a breaking point that, that spurred him on to the events of Purge, Anarchy, and whatever the other one was. But I, the second Purge movie, to me, was so awesome, because I think that the first Purge was a great premise and it seems like a natural fit for a horror but once they spun it into more of like an action adventure the punisher kind of vibe i was like this is exactly what i want the purge to be so i'm not sure which angle they're going to go with this one but i agree with perry the origin story is the way to go it's the only way to go for the purge franchise right now because you you want to see how this all started roca you want to mm. see the monetization of it is i mean it's america of course that's what's going to happen sooner rather than later but i also think that i want to see how this was sold to people initially because even when we meet in the, in the first purge ethan hawk's family we're like how exactly did they get this to pass the buck with the public so this is going to be a very interesting way and maybe we even get three more purge movies that all take place before the events of the first movie so i love what they're going for it's a little early we don't have a right around the mm. cast yet but just on premise alone do you like the way the purge prequel sounds yeah absolutely and I, i'm with perry i hated that third one and and you know i i was dragged to the first one uh and because it was set in my hometown dale city virginia that's where i grew up so they said it that was like oh see my hometown on screen that's first time and i wasn't 100 percent in it but the second one blew the doors off me i really enjoyed that and i was like okay this is what it can be and the third one really crapped the bed so to me i this is a great idea so i buy this going back to a prequel this sounds like like battle royale if you've ever seen that film the japanese film there i mean like that is what this feels like they're all stuck on this island it's a social commentary what's going to happen here they're talking about money and the fact that they're ripping it out of the headlines from today and talk and wanting to make comments about how this anger that's currently going on in the country can be kind of explored through this prism of the purge. I think it totally works. And I'm with you, Mark. Like, how did this whole thing start? How did it pass the bar? And if it leaves a lesson for us going to see the movie of how something like this can actually occur in our own society, if it make it believable enough, it may cause a lot of people to take a moment and, you know, kind of rethink it or step back and maybe see it through a different perspective. Movies have been known to change people's minds. Even the craziest, dumbest movies sometimes can change your mind about a situation or an experience so hopefully the purge does that but i buy it based just on that premise alone i'm excited to see what they would do with that Schnepp, you seem like a guy that survived his <laughs> fair share of purge experience oh, yeah. what do you think about this movie it's purge this morning um i don't know what you guys are talking about this uh this, the third one was the, the best one ever the third purge oh. Oh. just kidding it sucked it was a horrible film i hated it um so but i remember talking with a bunch of people after we experienced the third piece of garbage that it was that we were like well this series is definitely over i would go back in time i would go to the first purge and a lot of us were talking about you could set or just even do a, a prison one or do a you know try to you know refresh it somehow because the third one sucked so bad so this premise sounds great i'm 100 percent in i'm glad they're doing the first purge it's even better than the premise is even better than what i had imagined that they're starting it off on an island and it's very much almost like escape from staten island it's sort, oh, yeah. sort of with a you know i used to be like that and then you're gonna watch a clint eastwood type guy get crazy murderous style that makes a second movie where you're like all the the scummy you know government people are like making it a reality show like check out staten island there you know they're gonna turn it that's exactly what it's mm -hmm. gonna be like so all these hundreds of billions of people would be watching the the move the the uh the staten island thing so that the second one can be like just you know purge in america or something so i love it yeah i mean uh i think that there has to be some measure of success that happens with this first staten island purge in order for it to sweep the nation the next year perry i want to ask you this because like i love the second purge so much because of the action vibe but i do think that there's horror elements you could place into this. Do you think that this should be more horror or more action-based? It's. I was actually thinking about this, hearing everybody's answers, because I really did love the second one, but you guys know my mentality with movies. I definitely veer more towards straightforward horror. And you, you know what's funny is when I first saw the first Purge movie, 
I wasn't really into it. And then all of a sudden I went back again and then I caught myself going back again and becoming more and more drawn into that specific family story, plus the greater meaning of the purge and what it means for the country. So I really did like the home invasion vibe to that. I think there can be a mix and I think there needs to be a mix just because of the nature of the purge and what the whole thing is. So I would like to see them find kind of a balance between one and two. That's right, Schnepp, you're going horror action for Purge the prequel. I think uh, horror action. Leading not, with not, horror. A, not action <laughs> horror. horror. Yeah, but it's got to have both. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's what the purge is. The purge is a, a great blending, especially not the first one, but the second one. A great bl blending of both. So, but I would stick horror action. Roka, you think this should be a rom com? Why? Yeah, uh, there's a lot to explore here. Love can be <laughs> love can bloom in the strangest of places. So why wouldn't it bloom during the purge? And don't be surprised if there is a love story. That makes sense, don't you think? I just love this idea of a Clint Eastwood Snake Pl Pliskin kind of guy. Hey, let's do the purge. Yeah. Yeah, I love this. You see somebody during the purge wearing an eye patch, go the other direction. <laughs> They've lived more life than you. All right, let's move on to definitely one of the most exciting stories of the weekend. We got a surprise trailer. We are free, Ashley. Why is that? <laughs> Universal Pictures released the first teaser trailer and poster for Fifty Shades Freed, the third movie in the Fifty Shades franchise. Jamie Dornan and Dakota Johnson return as Christian Grey and Anastasia Steele and expand upon upon the events from the 2015 and 2017 blockbuster films that have grossed almost 950 million worldwide. The new film also stars Kim Basinger and Marcia Gay Harden and lands in theaters on Valentine's Day 2018. Schnepp, buy or sell the first teaser for Fifty Shades Freed. Well, they're not going to ruin my Valentine's Day. That's all I can say. <laughs> uh, I know this is Ashley's favorite. I, I I'm sure you can't wait for the, uh, the oh. trilogy. Oh, my God. So finally, the trilogy will be complete. Hold a special place. The Grey Saga cares. This is garbage <laughs> cinema. Garbage cinema is what it is. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 0 for 1 here on the lead sale. I want to throw this right back to, to <coughs> Ashley and Wendy. I guess we'll go back to Ashley and Wendy after we hear from Roka and Perry. But uh, uh, Roka, yeah. I'm going to go to you first because some days you believe in true love. <laughs> Other days, not so much. Right. How are we feeling this morning? Uh, I do not believe in this. That, I, are we still <laughs> doing this? Like, we're really doing a third one of these things? Really? I, again, the, the trailer says to me, look, ladies, all you need is a lot of money and abs and you can get understood and forgiven for any of your weird proclivities as a man. Is that not it's true? so ridiculous. I'm like, what, what are we doing? Make up your mind. This is so, I hate this whole thing. I tried, a friend took me to see the first one, my friend Sarah, and I was like, Ugh. and then I, I saw the second one on page. And I was like, this is so irritatingly stupid. So to me, maybe because I'm a man, I just don't get it, but I, I don't need to see this. And it breaks my heart that James Foley is directing this because James Foley, uh, uh, from Glen Gary, Glenn Ross, and Confidence. I'm such a massive fan of his art. Uh, you know, I'm such a massive fan of his films. After Dark, My Sweet. Those films were great, but then he's got these weird kind of anomalies, like who's that girl, and these other things in his resume. So it just breaks my heart that he's doing these films. It's I called think house payments, Roka. Yeah, I guess so. No, I don't hate on the dude. I'm sorry. I don't hate on anybody who takes a job and makes that money. Fair. Just, you know, you don't I, have no, to I see just wanted the a better film. material. I wanted to. Yes. I think he deserves better material. You're That's I guess right. where I'm coming from. I don't fault him for taking it. It just breaks my heart. That he can't get better, or he should get better material. That's all. So to me, I sell it. So I sell it. There you know, Perry, I see that Jamie Dornan, and I think that is a CrossFit phenom. How do you <laughs> feel about Fifty Shades Freed? Yeah, he he was not the greatest in that first movie. She surprised me in the first Dakota's one, though. Great. Any credit I give the first Fifty Shades movie goes to uh, Dakota Johnson. But I like Dakota. even though I was okay with that first one, I didn't feel like I should have seen the second one. And when I was like out of town or something and missed a screening, and then I ha heard all of you just hating on it, and I said to myself, I'm not going to see this unless I have to. So that was how I was going to judge this teaser. If I watched this teaser and had even the slightest desire to go and see this new movie, I was going to give it a buy. I did not. I don't think it's a good trailer either. It's like they're so desperate to build some suspense at the end that they're they're just like, let's throw like any scene with a little bit of action or a gun. Like none of it makes any sense if you look at every single frame of that. And that's not how you build suspense in a trailer. The only credit, only little bit of credit that I give this trailer is at the very end when they say the full trailer is coming in November. Wouldn't it be nice if all studios did that so we didn't have to sit here thinking like, when are we going to get a full trailer for something? That's not this. Uh, <laughs> they need to tell you when the full trailer is coming. They need to tell you everything they can about this movie because otherwise we're going to lose interest. Now, look, my only question watching this trailer is why is Dakota Johnson still surprised <laughs> at all of this shit that this guy owns? 
shit. Like, the, That's the your plane? He lands helicopters <laughs> at your apartment and sweeps you off your feet. And then we pull up to an airport, and she's like, "You." he's like, I own that. She's like, oh, my God, really? You're, <laughs> you're married to the guy now. Do you not look at the books no, at no, all? Like, remember, like, he added, no, we own it. We own it. Oh, we own it. You're yeah. so rich. I love you. You're so rich. I think that this is, I, I think that this movie is going to be great, and I'll tell you why. Oh. I, I sell the trailer. I, I think that this movie is going to be great because it proves that just because you tie the knot, just because you get married, it doesn't mean that you can't spice up the relationship with an occasional, you know, saddle or bullwhip or swing or whatever the hell they do in that dirty basement or airplane in this case. I think that they can have a lot of fun with this movie, but I throw it to the experts. <laughs> Ashley and Wendy. I don't want to be known Whoa. as the expert on 50 Shades. You guys have been promoted to experts. Um, the first one and the second one, I, I, got both, I got really excited for both of them, but after seeing the first one, I was like, that sucked ass. And then we, a bunch of us saw the second one together, and if the first one didn't suck ass, the second one really mm. sucked ass. Yeah. So this third one, I was like, this is going to be shit. This trailer's going to suck. I watched the trailer, and I was like, I really like the trailer. I'm not going to lie. There was a wedding. I love weddings. <laughs> there was a gun. I am obsessed with murder. So, like, it really intrigued me. Good and also, to know. I know. Good also, to know. Um, Jamie Dornan in The Fall I was I was really obsessed with his character in the fall on Netflix and he just had this creepy vibe to him. So I really hope that he brings that to this movie. But I just have to go in with it thinking this is going to suck and I won't be let down. There you go. Uh, I mean, OK, for the first one actually surprised me because I had such low expectations going in mm -hmm. that I was like, oh, it's actually not that bad. Dakota Johnson was really what, who saved the movie for me. The second one we all went and saw it together. We made fun of the entire movie <laughs> the whole terrible. time. The whole theater did. And I, I've never done that at a press screening before. So that was kind of weird. Um, so this one, I was like, why do we even need a third one? But I guess you should just finish franchise while you're at it. Um, I hated the trailer. It, it was absolutely garbage. Uh, the only thing I liked out of it was her wedding dress because it's very, very mm. pretty. Her line of like, oh, you own that? I know. That no, was not He terrible. was the guy that who, when, when her boss was fired, who was the man at the end of the movie, at end of the trailer, by the way. Oh. Remember, he comes back because he was all like him. emo and stuff because yeah. he got fired. So Christian Grey buys her company after like her boss... <laughs> sexually harasses her and, and you question about whether or not he owns a jet? Come on. <laughs> so now look, probably not going to go see this in theater. Yeah. She looked at the books. You looked at the books of the first movie. You know what this guy, you're <laughs> clearly aware of what this guy's business is capable of on a day to day. That would be like somebody walking to my car and I'm like, oh yeah, this is the Ford Fusion. She, you own that? Yeah, <laughs> I lease it. All right, let's move on to our next topic. Marvel unveiled a new TV spot for Thor Ragnarok, giving fans even more reason to look forward to the third entry in the Thor franchise. Though there's only a couple snippets of new footage, the spot reinforces something special is coming from director Taika Waititi's take on the God of, the, of Thunder. The film opens on November 3rd and stars Chris Hemsworth, Tom Hiddleston, Kate Blanchett, Idris Elba, Jeff Goldblum, Tessa Thompson, Carl Urban, Mark Ruffalo, and Anthony Hopkins. Mark, buy yourself the new TV spot for Thor Ragnarok. Huge buy for me. It got me through some of the football action yesterday. Don't worry, my fantasy teams did very well. And watching this, this is what I want a commercial on TV to do is because there's a whole group of people out there that had no idea that Thor Ragnarok was coming out or that this movie was going to be a thing. And now all of a sudden, this acted as an announcement. It was a nice combination of the tone that we got from the trailers that shows both a very comedic take but also action heavy so we got to see a couple of light jokes we also got to see thor be the god of thunder that we all know he can be so schnepp i loved everything about this 30 seconds how do you feel absolutely loved it loved seeing uh thor fighting surter like just little little scenes like that we're just like yeah you know i think they did that for all the comic nerds <laughs> a little sprinkling in there for and then just i mean it looks so beautiful and cinematically shot i'm blown away i'm so happy that they got Taika. They needed to get somebody to put a different spin on it, and he's pretty much unleashed Kirby in this uh, in this movie. Is what I feel. Every shot is drenched in it. So can't wait to see the film. It's a great, great TV, uh, TV spot. Two buys. We're off to a hot start. Perry, we keeping the trend going? Oh, that we are. I am buying this one. I watched this thing, and all I could think of was. 
like fun. That looks mm-hmm. like a ton of fun. It looks like what I want a Thor movie to be because the things that I took away from the last two movies was how funny Chris Hemsworth can be. And and also in Ultron too. And it just seems like his sense of humor on screen with that character paired with what I know Taika Waititi can do. It's coming together perfectly. I love the look of everything in this. I'm going to love Jeff Goldblum. I can already tell I'm going to like Tessa Thompson a lot too. I like that we got a couple more shots of her in this. So I am hyped for this. John Roca, when you were at Big Wang's yesterday and this trailer came on, <laughs> did you tell everybody in the bar, hey, watch Movie Talk because we'll be talking about this tomorrow? I did, and I made them all shut up. The trailer's on. I did, I did all that. You know, I did all that. It, it didn't really work. You Eagles fans, pipe down. There's a trailer. <laughs> I got a couple of wings in my face. But listen, this was this was an awesome TV spot, and it gives you just a little bit of the more of the arena stuff and stuff with Jeff Goldblum in the in you know in that visual that he has there announcing everything. So you know it's going to be a visually amazing film just already from the shots from the trailers that we've seen before. It's fantastic, and I think you're right, John. This whole it's going all in on all Kirby. Like it just it feels that it's going back to what, what some of the best things about the Thor uh, comic books have is this just comedic moments randomly, but still these incredible gods and uh, Kate Blanchett looks fantastic. It's it just I just can't wait to see what she does with hell. And I Tessa Thompson, I would fight all the gods mm. in Asgard for Tessa Thompson. That woman is fantastic, incredibly talented, and gorgeously beautiful on screen. So everything and the Re- the Revengers bit just perfect, yeah. and that tells you that's the right director for mm-hmm. this installment because people have their issues about the first and second one. So you want to hit all the right notes, and nothing I've seen from them hasn't hit all the right notes. And what TT is gonna, it, he just brings the right comic sensibility to this, and I think this is gonna blow the doors off the box office. I really think pe- word of mouth is gonna make this mm-hmm. thing blow up like Guardians of the Galaxy did. You would fight all the guard, all the gods in, in Asgard, Asgard for Tessa Thompson. Absolutely. Maybe you just give her your number. You go back home. <laughs> well, you got to prove and your worth sometimes. Ah, he's out of retirement, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. All right. Before we move on to mailbag, I want to remind you guys that this is not the only daily show we have on Collider Video. Later today, it was hosted by that young man right over there. John Schnepp is going to be up. <laughs> Heroes is now daily, as is TV Talk, hosted by Joshua Hercules Makuga, somebody who was very terrified by the movie It. And a new Schmodown is going to be dropping every day this week. We have new team matches for you guys every day. And then the singles title match is going to be on Friday. Plus, the It spoiler review is now up live on Collider Video. You can check that out. Perry Nemiroff was there. You guys got pretty intense. Oh my god, yeah. I was saying this last week. It's one of my favorite spoiler reviews we've ever done because we went through it character by character. And Mm. we were talking for like 45 minutes and we had a wrap and there was still so much more we wanted to get into, but it's a great chat. Uh, This was brought to my attention right before we went uh, live is that uh, Copster was saying that somebody over the weekend told him that Pennywise sounds like Mm Scooby-Doo and now he can't get that out of his head. (laughs) So it's not really a spoiler, but it's like you go see it again. Pennywise does not sound like Scooby-Doo. Dude, oh, that's the, no way. That's the yeah. word on the street. The popcorn goes pop, pop, pop. <laughs> Ruby, Ruby, Ruby. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's certainly possible. Who knew Roka had that in him? Well done. You know what? Tessa Thompson might think twice about this now. <laughs> All right, we're going to save some time at the end of the show for your live Twitter questions. Go ahead and start tweeting us right now at Collider Video. In the meantime, let's get to Mailbag. Who's sending us letters today, Ashley? It's Austin, and he writes, Hey, everyone. I love watching you every day. You all make each day more fun and informative. I was just thinking about how I actually enjoyed The Last Airbender when I saw it in theaters and on TV when most people I know absolutely hate it. I know, I know, but this is what I was thinking. I believe I enjoyed the film because I never saw the TV series. However, the film got me into the series and I love it and I understand why the movie is not good. Are there any movies you had seen that got you into the source material you hadn't watched prior? Um... It's a great question. I, I disagree with the last there. <laughs> because i never seen the TV show either. I saw that movie and I was like, I'm running far, far away, which is uh, a, a problem because I hear the TV show is great. I know Wendy's a big fan of it. So um, I, as far as so- a movie getting you into source material, I'm kind of famous around here for not investigating <laughs> source material as far as literature goes. So I don't really read too much, but there's been a lot of movies that came out that retroactively got into the comic books, especially in the 90s, things that came out like The Crow. I wanted to go and explore everything that was about that world. So that's what I would say for that, as opposed to something, I can't recall a movie getting me into a TV show. Schnepp, do you have a different take on this? Yeah, definitely The Last Airbender, no, not. <laughs> but, but you know, you know, gravitas for admitting that and making it a, you know, a question. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, a lot of drinking is probably involved. <laughs> well, I'll just admit it on the <laughs> airbender. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I'm not he too used hired the word too drunk. gravitas, he has to wave. Oh, <laughs> yeah. there we go. Um, <laughs> I'm not too hired too drunk. I, I like this moment. Know, they ask, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a little more difficult as far as the comic book movies because I'd already been reading them. So I've been waiting, even with the Dolph Lundgren Punisher. Finally, the Punisher, like before nobody cared back then. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, not really. Okay. No. You're just on the other end of it. You yeah, already I'm on the, the flip material. side. Yeah. yeah. Already, like a lot of the source material, I had already read Dune. I really, you know, a big sci fi horror nut. I'd read all these Stephen King novels already. So, sorry. Nothing's, Head of the curve, baby. Nothing surprises Schnepp. The man's on top of everything. That's what I like about him. Well, how about you, Mr. Roca? Source material? Yeah. Uh, well, back in the old days when I was gonna, when I was uh, angling to be an actor, I, whenever people would bring up animated series, I'd be like, that's for kids. Like, I never watched any of that stuff past a certain age. Mm. And then my friend sat me down in his apartment and made me watch ba Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Yeah. Phantasm? Phantasm. The, yeah, mm. fa yeah, Phantasm. And I had never seen the animated series. Mm. And so I saw this movie and I was just blown away that they could do this with animation because I grew up with like G.I. Joe and Transformers. Right. They didn't get like this. Uh, and I hadn't seen Akira by, at this point. So when I saw that, I was like, whoa. And so I went retroactively back and borrowed his DVDs and started watching the series of the animated. So that is how I got oh, into Bas cool. the, to Batman, which was Kevin Conroy's, Conroy's a hero of mine, absolutely. Yeah, I guess retroactively you, you could consider Batman too because I saw Batman 1989 when I was a really little kid. Mm -hmm. I discovered movie theater nachos for the first time, which was uh, <laughs> both good and bad for my future. And then I got into like all the Frank Miller stuff, a lot of runs of Batman. I really got into that from seeing the Michael Key movie on the big screen. How about you, Pear? I know you're a big reader. I am, but it's, it's not the exact way that it's described in the question. It's not like a scenario where I saw the movie and then I went to go read. You guys know I like to study and I like to be prepared and knowledgeable about this stuff before I see it. So what I tend to do is when movies are announced, then I'll go read mm. the book and then I'll see the movie. But to match this example, Jurassic Park is perfect because I grew up watching that movie over and over and over. And when I hit a certain age, I'm like, oh, I'm ready to read this book now. And I read the book. But recently... I'm really happy that I saw the new Death Note movie mm. after I watched some of the anime because uh. I really liked the anime. And I'm afraid that if I had seen the movie first, I wouldn't have felt the need to go back after. Mm. So I'm glad that that played out that way. And then right now I'm reading uh, The Shining. So th there's actually another appropriate example. I love that movie. I wanted to know more about the character, so I'm reading the book. How far into the book are you? The, like the, halfway. Uh, the twins show mm. up yet? Elevator, uh, blood? They're they're mentioned. Yeah, old lady yeah. in the bathtub. Yep. Mm. You're, you're you're going way too far ahead. And you know what? You can experience this for yourself. And if also, you the, follow my book. You're just after. talking about the movie as well. So uh, that stuff I will. Isn't really... I, I will have Perry read the book too. <laughs> That's about as far. <laughs> Elevator, you know what? That's Elevator what audio books do for you. You don't even have to read. Yeah. But I'm I... never gonna win this argument ever. Also, the elevator with blood has nothing to do with the book. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's go to live Twitter <laughs> questions. This is part of the show where we hear from you guys. Uh, Wendy, you had asked me about a Twitter question earlier in the show, and uh, I think it's a great one, and I think you should ask because I have no idea if it's true or not. So let's do it. Uh, me neither. So this is <laughs> probably completely rumor, but a bunch of people are tweeting me, and they're tweeting me links to a Japanese interview that I can't watch because we're in the middle of the show, but it says that Ryan Johnson during this interview says or mentions that he will not be directing episode nine. Oh, very, very interesting. If that is indeed the case, if it came from Ryan Johnson, then uh, it might also be he might not know if he's directing episode nine or not. We may not have gotten confirmation on whether he's directing episode nine or not. But uh, if this is true, let's just have a little bit of fun with us today. Schnapp, do you think, I mean, Ryan Johnson seemed to be the incumbent choice because everything on The Last Jedi seems so peachy, but right. it really is a directorial decision if you want to helm another movie on that scale. If Ryan Johnson is not the guy for for episode nine, who are you taking? Uh, boy, I mean, I certainly would hope that Ryan Johnson would perhaps at least write or help with the writing or maybe rewrite the story or get the script involved, being more involved in the script. Uh, ha having not seen The Last Jedi, none of us have seen it yet, but I like Ryan Johnson. I like Looper, I like Brick, I like mm -hmm. all of his mm -hmm. films. So uh, I can't wait to see what he's done with the Star Wars universe and the Star Wars characters. Um, you know, 
I said last week, I wouldn't mind seeing JJ return, but I'd mm -hmm. like to see someone else write it. To, you know, because JJ is not, a, you know, he's not a good closer. He's a good opener with his mystery box stuff. And he's like, here's a bunch of questions. See ya. You know, it's like, <laughs> well, wait, what about the answers? Who cares? I'm on to something else. So I want to see someone. No, visually, he's incredible, and story wise, he can open everything. But it's like, I need somebody who's a closer. So he just I sits around a campfire, he starts a story, <laughs> he gets up to go take a pee, and just never comes back. We're just like, do we put the fire out? I don't know. Right, he just puts went. a giant clown next to me. Here's another, <laughs> see ya. You know, yeah. wasn't all this cool? I mean, look, I Bye. love The Force Awakens, so I would not be against JJ Abrams coming back at all. I think that'd be a really good call. Um, but you could also go for a fresh out of the box talent that you think uh, can more jive with what Ryan Johnson did with The Last Jedi moving forward because Ryan Johnson by some accounts has written at least a treatment for episode nine so if you're going off that template Roka who do you think would be the right person to take over uh, listen I know I'm an idiot but hey. I would love to close this loop completely and bring Lucas back and have him direct the last one Ladies and, and gentlemen, have, the internet I, has been set on fire by know, John people, Rocha. People are throwing their computers at the wall. Uh, but I do agree with John. I would like, and you, Mar, I would like Ryan to come back and write it because everyone knows Lucas' dialogue is terrible. It's stilted. It's not any good. But I wonder what he would do with someone else's script. And it'd be a great way to close the circle, bring him back into the fold, give him a shot at this. Because Jedi feels very much like Lucas's New Hope, even though it was a different person who directed it. But the reason Empire Strikes Back st st uh, stands out so much is it's because it's so far away from what Lucas envisioned with New Hope. His style and so this is a way to kind of maybe close the loop i'd love jj to come back to maybe the ryan johnson maybe there's because it's a japanese interview maybe there's a translation issue there so we don't mm. know 100 if it's actually true but another person if you don't want to bring out lucas there's another person who has a film that just made almost 120 million dollars Muschietti would be an interesting choice to come back and do, or to come to the, into the Star Wars fold and do, and kind of close this thing out and see what he could do with this material. We always saw what he could do with source material like it, so it'd be interesting to see what he would do with Star Wars and would it carry the darker frame into the third one from what we're hearing about Last Jedi. Perry, I'm going to give you two options. I'm going to give you option A is you can pick a new director. Um, option B is you can be Kathleen Kennedy and Lucas, and you can see this interview and say, okay, we'll tack on another. $20 million uh, <laughs> right. oh boy. for Ryan Johnson to come back. We really want you, Ryan. We know you're tired. Come on back and do nine. Which I one do you think? I don't know. I, I don't feel comfortable until I've seen the movie or at least seen more of the movie mm. through promotional material to say I want Ryan Johnson back because really we're weighing him against to, uh, a troubled production in this immediate moment. It, it doesn't feel fair. It's only natural to put him on a pedestal when there's so many other problems happening. Right. So I don't want to say that just yet. The one name that the internet was floating around the past couple of weeks, or, or just week now, is Patty Jenkins. Mm. And I know that's a hot that's name idea. to say right now when Wonder Woman was so successful. But given the fact that she very clearly can handle a movie of that scale, and she did such good work with... Focusing on that one character in a really personal way, but in a really big way at the same time, it just seems like she's got the skill set to be able to handle something like this. So as much as I am a huge fan of it, I don't see what Andy Muschietti accomplishing in it. I don't I don't really see how that can pave the way for him successfully handling a Star Wars film the same way I could see that with Patty Jenkins. Mm. Yeah. You know what? I was gonna throw in somebody who's no one's ever mentioned, Lawrence Kasdan. Oh. I mean, he's he's such a great screenwriter, mm -hmm. um, and, and he's was, directed movies. Yeah, so yeah he was yeah. like kind of like uh, backseat directing the Han Solo film, mm. and kind of he would have done the he would have actually done the, the Han Solo film, but there were all these uh, these uh, issues as far as like you know you, you're already this you can't do that. There was some kind of like byline or law that even though that's why they got Ron Howard, it would have been Lawrence Kasdan. I say give it to Lawrence Kasdan. Yeah, I mean, Lawrence Kasdan is uh, is certainly an, an option there. I'm seeing a lot of names being thrown in the chat room now. Spielberg is always mentioned when oh, it comes yeah. to Star Wars because he's talking about closing the loop. Maybe, yeah. if, maybe if it's not George Lucas, Spielberg might be a nice second option sure. in there. Patty Jenkins, certainly, if the Wonder Woman vibe is something that is so happy and positive that I would, a person, I'd like that to translate to episode nine. I know some Star Wars fans out there disagree with me. They like darker tones, but we're going to get that in The Last Jedi, hopefully. I'd like episode nine to end happily. Uh, Ava DuVernay, uh, uh, Tommy Wiseau. There's a lot of names that people are throwing around out there on the chat room. So um, that is going to do it for us here on Collider Video. I just want to see if anybody picked up on it. It's early, but they got it. Everybody's ears work. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks to the crew for getting up early. And thank you to our beloved panel full of panelists. First up, John Schnepp, where can the kids find you? Well, you can find me on Heroes later today. Bye. <laughs>
Short and sweet. Perry, can you beat that time? P. Nemer off on Twitter and Instagram. Bye. <laughs> John Roca, they've set the bar very, very high. You have four seconds go. <laughs> Silver sp uh, plastic spoons. Ugh. No, at the Roca says, find me Twitter and Instagram. Sorry, couldn't do it. <laughs> if you just got rid of the plastic spoons bit, I mean, I think we know where to cut the fat here. In your pro you want to try Did it again? Did you say fat again? Hey, wait. Is it because the shirt's tight? Redo it. I purge, purge, fat. purge, purge, purge. We're going we're gonna to do it again. Ready? Ready? Here we go. This is how we do it. You, you write, you edit, you test it out, we edit some more. John Roca, where can the kids find you? At the Roca says on Twitter and Instagram. Plastic spoons! Oh, he, no. he did it. All right. Ashley Mova, where can the kids check you out? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got you, girl. Ashley Mova, In Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. Wendy Lee picking up the slack. See, that's well how short mine was. I didn't even say anything. This week on so. the Tank Toppers. <laughs> Ashley is just so confused as to how he can own that jet, and she doesn't know. <laughs> One day I'll get there. One day I'll get there. <laughs> oh. Okay, no shoulder shake, apparently. Let's go to Wendy Lee. We're not <laughs> getting into that. We're going to get funny, Wendy. At Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. This is Movie we talk my name is merely mark ellis you guys can find me at mark ellis live i'll be in philadelphia but you guys beat the crap out of my team so i'm going to come to your city and tell some jokes at the punchline mark ellis live.com is a place to get tickets we'll see you guys right here bright and early for a new quarter movie talk tomorrow happy monday guys <laughs> hey guys if you like this video click the thumbs up button also make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel it'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at collider